the shooting range. In this episode, not just the forward motion, how do tanks steer? What is this? Strange British vehicles that confuse the rest of the world. Hotline, the developers answer questions that Xu left in the comments. But first, let's start with a two-time miracle, the N1K1J Shidden. It's not a big deal if a conventional aircraft is turned into a seaplane. There were quite a lot of machines built this way. But what if you want to do it the other way around, to make a regular aircraft out of a floatplane fighter? That was done only once. The start of the story was fairly dull. At the end of 1941, the Imperial Navy ordered the Kavanisha Aircraft Company to design and produce a reliable floatplane fighter. Kavanisha engineers knew what they were doing, and in the summer of 1942, their new aircraft, the Kavanishi N1 King Kyofu, went into full-scale production. The problem was that by that time, the situation and the world underwent a drastic change. Japan didn't only enter the war, but also lost the Battle of Midway. The Zero had trouble keeping pace with the newest American fighters, and Raidens were still very rare. That's when Hashiguchi Yoshio, the chief designer of the Kavanishi Aircraft Company, had an idea. He decided to strap some landing gear on the N1K instead of the pontoon. Naturally, nobody expected the new machine to be any good. The plan was to make something that would work as a temporary solution and buy the Japanese some time to prepare a new generation of high-speed interceptors. Dictum factum, in a very short time, Kavanishi engineers designed the J6K Jinpu that was basically the rework Kyofu and used the familiar Mitsubishi Kasei two-row 14-cylinder radial engine. The experiment was pretty successful. The Jinpu turned out to be a decent plane. It could easily go into production. There was one little problem. Nobody authorized this work. The people at Kavanishi acted on their own initiative. In wartime Japan, that was something way out of the ordinary. Nothing was done if there was no official contact with the army or the navy. What made the situation even more interesting was that after some time, Hashiguchi declared that the Jinpu should be discarded in favor of a much better aircraft based on the same Kyofu design, now outfitted with a more powerful Nakajima Homare 18-cylinder radial engine. The bosses at Kavanishi scratched their heads, washed their hands of the project, just in case, and basically gave the engineer a carte blanche. That's how Hashiguchi got a unique chance to give the Navy something that they desperately needed without even knowing it. Well, in this case, ignorance was actually bliss. When the military found out that the team at Kavanishi was working on this project, things went south really quickly. Basically, the management was accused of wasting precious resources. It took the designer of the new fighter forever to persuade a Navy test pilot to give it a try, and then it only made everything worse. The pilot loved it, and now the Navy wanted to know why the Halo aircraft was still in development and not in production. Hashiguchi later wrote that it had been the first time in his life when he had considered changing careers. He did his best to explain the new fighter was not ready for combat, that there were still many flaws to address, but nobody listened. The Imperial Navy wanted the new fighter, and they wanted it fast. In the end, the people at Kavanishi yielded and launched the mass production of the new aircraft. In this stressful situation, no one had time to realize that they were all part of one huge and almost impossible story. The Japanese not only managed to make a viable land-based fighter out of a floatplane aircraft, they designed a machine that could take on the bleeding-edge aircraft of the USA, and all of that without any support from the military. Of course, there was still much to be done before this fighter could turn into the fearsome Shiden Kai, but that's a story for another day. Tanks have tracks that are great for going forwards, but aren't that good for turning. What did tanks do to overcome this problem? There are two basic approaches. You can steer the tank by speeding up or slowing one track, while nothing happens to the other one, or by affecting both tracks at the same time, with the help of some kind of a differential system. The first kind of steering mechanism is pretty straightforward. 
The tracks on either side of the tank are operated independently. In order to turn, a driver reduces power to one track, causing it to slow down. That makes the tank lose some speed, and the vehicle is driven into a turn, almost pivoting around the slower track. This is the kind of steering system that you find on the T-34, the Panzer IV, and the Japanese Type 97 Chiha. The differential system works in a different fashion. While one track is slowed, the differential gears rotate and speed up the other track, so there is a direct connection between the speeds of two tracks. With this kind of steering system, a machine can turn smoothly while advancing without bleeding speed. The vehicles that make use of differential steering include the M4 Sherman, the Centurion and the Panzer VI Tiger. Each approach has its own strong and weak points. Differential steering mechanisms allow for very smooth and fast turns, something that is actually important for light tanks. But at the same time, a lot of vehicles with such systems have a rather wide turn radius. They simply cannot make a sharp turn. Another important thing to consider is the stability of movement. Let's say our tank is driving on a well-built smooth road. In this case, the terrain resistance that the tracks have to deal with is the same for both of them. No problem here. Here's your perfect straight line. But what if you have to do a bit of crossroad driving, which seems to happen quite often during wars? The physical properties of terrain beneath the tank will change all the time, and it will often be different between tracks. The differential steering system doesn't handle the situation very well. The vehicle starts to wobble. It's hardly surprising. If one track slows down due to a higher terrain resistance, the other will speed up, and that will make the machine turn at least slightly. But if the tracks are operated independently, it allows for a more reliable and predictable movement under any conditions. Fascinating, isn't it? As we already started to talk about armored vehicles, let's discuss some, let's say, rather unusual machines designed by the British. We'll kick it off with this Cromwell variant, the RP-3. Everybody likes rockets, right? Right. But usually you have rocket armament instead of a gun, or as some kind of separate entity installed on the turret. Well, British engineers soar above conventions and the norm. They just installed immobile rocket rails on the welded frame and then mounted some standard aviation rockets on those rails. Good to go. Nope, you cannot change the angle of fire and you can hardly aim. That's fine, hardships build character, or so we heard. Then there's this fantastic beast, the Turtus. Nine penetrable front armor, seven crew members, and a very peculiar choice of a gun. Just think about it. It would not be impossible to cram a much bigger cannon in there. Take a look at the Soviet Su-100Y, for example. But the designers decided to go with a gun of a smaller caliber. That has great penetration, by the way. The next vehicle is the Tonian multi-turreted contraption called the Vickers A1E1 Independent. Yeah, that very tank from the 1920s. Its extravagant look and huge crew are a point and reminder of the times when battles could still be won by reckless cavalry strikes. Oh, those were the days. Slow and cumbersome, this old man is in no rush to join the fray these days. But if it finally gets there, you better pack your things and leave as quickly as possible. Anything above 32 km an hour will probably work for you. The Independent has a decent gun and lots of ammo. And finally, the crooks of the biscuit. The magnificently weird self-propelled 17-pounder Valentine Mark I Archer. The British are supposed to be pretty good at all things that have to do with archery, with Robin Hood and whatnot. But this exact archer faces backwards. Yeah, just like that. The gun faces the rear of the chassis instead of the front. Get ready for some fairly unconventional gameplay. At least the 17-pounder is nothing to be sneezed at. God save the British engineers. And the king, of course. Now it's time for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official War Thunder forums. Here we'll have a more lighthearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. The first question comes from a player called Pedro Angel. Will you ever implement the functionality of the machine gun of the radio operator gunner? 
Yep, we've said it before and we'll say it again. Eventually, all machine guns that could work in real life will work in the game as well. Eventually. Then a player called Ramen Weaver asks, Will you ever add armored trains to the game? That would be awesome. Hey man, we lost these behemoths of war. Let's be honest here, who doesn't? But they don't really fit anywhere in the current version of gameplay, so the answer is no. Next question comes from Not the Gourd. Gaijin, since we were able to use smoke during April Fool's event, will we get smoke for other tanks? We'll just put it this way. April Fool's is a great opportunity to test new machines. Uh-huh. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you in the shooting range.